Hello, in this video we are going to talk a little bit about, in very broad strokes, what it means to take a look at arguments carefully and systematically to try and figure out how they work and whether or not they work the way that they are supposed to and be properly convincing to us. So we're going to talk about argument analysis and argument evaluation and how we're going to explore those two things in the course. So. When we're talking about critical thinking, what we're talking about is careful thinking that uses criteria and that evaluates decisions and reflects on how we think. And when we're talking about critical thinking as applied to arguments, things that are intended to rationally persuade somebody to adopt a particular point of view, we generally split it up into two components. One is called argument analysis, and the other one is argument evaluation. And we usually present them with analysis first, and then evaluation afterwards. But it's not really like that in practice. So usually we'll talk about analysis, and by analysis we mean literally the breaking apart of a particular set of statements or claims that somebody makes so that we can see what the actual parts are that make up the argument, right? Arguments aren't some, when we express them in English or in writing or in any language, they aren't just one un undifferentiated mass of stuff, right? They have pieces that seem to do different jobs. And so the analysis part is the breaking up part to disassemble it to try and better understand it. And so the best analogy to use here is if you are trying to figure out a machine of some sort, a car engine, a coffee maker, something like that, one of the ways to understand it yourself, to investigate it, is to take it apart and see how the pieces fit together. Uh, that's analysis. The second half of critical thinking about arguments is evaluation. That's where you look at each part and how the parts fit together, the things that you got from analysis, and you ask, are they supposed to fit this way? If they fit this way, do they work as intended? Those kinds of questions are evaluative questions, and when it comes to arguments, the idea is that we are trying to figure out with fit and function kinds of questions like that, whether the argument as designed and as put together actually does the job of rational persuasion well, right? So if we're looking at an engine or another machine and we're not sure whether it works or not, one of the things we can do obviously is turn the key, see if it turns on, see what it sounds like, those kinds of things. But another thing that we can do is we could disassemble it, take a look at the parts, see that all the right parts are where they are and inspect every part just to see whether it looks like it's the right size and shape for the location that it is, right? That it fits the the kind of what the part might we think ought to look like to do the job of something in that location in the machine. And um, we see if anything's burnt or cracked or, or those kinds of things. We're doing similar things when we talk about arguments. We're gonna try and split them up into their component pieces and then keeping track of how they all fit back together, we're going to start asking questions about is that a good fit or is there an ill-fitting piece in there or a broken piece or is something else gone wrong or is this a, uh, a machine, an argument that where everything fits the meshes together in the way that it should such that it was, it's smoothly running and would accomplish what it's designed to do. So the first thing we're going to do is that analysis part, breaking it up into parts and figuring out how those parts fit together. In this course, what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of take that analogy a little bit literally. That is, we are gonna take the argument apart and really display the relationships between all the parts in a very explicit way. So you kind of do this in other intellectual pursuits when you're learning essay writing. One of the things that you do or can do as part of the writing process, before you just dive in and start writing the essay, is you generate an outline, a bullet list of 
topics and other issues that you know that you need to cover in the essay a little a little plan right and that is kind of like argument mapping in that it is talking about it's picking out the structure of the essay right when you do an outline when you do a bulleted list like that you're not really worried about vocabulary or style or anything else you're just worried about when do I talk about things and in what order right and it's the order part that's the structure for an outline what we're talking about here is argument mapping is another kind of structure but it's vastly different than that narrative structure that you were talking that we talked about when we're talking about an outline we're not talking about what order to put things in in terms of kind of what flows better or naturally but a logical structure where things are arranged in ways that the logical relationships between the parts are best exemplified now you guys have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking about logical structure because you haven't had it brought to your attention explicitly you have lots of implicit knowledge so lots of intuitions about the relationships between different claims and whether they make sense or are logical or not but you've never been taught what all that stuff really means you just kind of picked it up as you've gone along so what we're going to do in this class is give a visual representation of that structure so that you can really develop your intuitions purposefully and not just kind of pick up what you see other people do but you have a kind of a more comprehensive understanding and appreciation for what logical structure means so that you can identify it and create it yourself the second half of what we're doing the evaluation part argument mapping this visual representation of arguments and what they do is going to help us increase your ability to competently evaluate arguments now you can evaluate arguments pretty good the key thing about argument mapping is that it's going to systematize your evaluation that is by writing things out drawing diagramming the argument and doing evaluation based on that we're going to make sure that you're better able to not miss important parts because you get distracted by some especially good part of an argument or some especially provocative or controversial part of an argument or you get distracted by one mistake and then stop looking for other mistakes that might be in there which you want to do because if someone's able to fix that one mistake then you might think that the whole argument now works and is fine and is strong and that might not be the case at all we can do this kind of mapping freehand just by you know just doodling on a piece of paper to kind of think things through just like you can write an outline on a piece of paper you don't need a word processor to write a bulleted list right but just like writing on a computer uh, when you're doing regular writing that kind of takes care of some of the drudgery stops some formatting mistakes that you would have to manually focus on not making right it indents all your nested bullets exactly right so you don't have to worry about confusing which layer you're working on in your outline and things like that and similarly when we use a computer program to do the argument mapping it's going to kind of take care of lots of those details the other thing that it's going to do is it's going to prevent you from making mistakes in how you lay things out because there are rules to how we map arguments some of them you're going to have to and want to explicitly learn so that you know that you are following them so that you can recognize arguments that don't follow them but other ones really kind of basic ones that are kind of part of how you do a map are going to be baked into how the software itself works it's not going to let you arrange things poorly in certain ways but it's going to do that in a really kind of gentle fashion such that you're not going to realize that it's guiding you away from connecting things in poor or insensible ways and th that can be good because if it didn't do that I would have to explicitly unteach you and spend time training oh no we need to do it this way I know that the you're allowed you you can do it this way but you shouldn't right it lets me not say some of those things and lets you learn some habits and habituate some good ways of constructing and thinking about arguments without having to really kind of focus on it or spend some explicit effort on it um, by the way 
uh, I will tend to use the words map and diagram and mapping and diagramming totally interchangeably for the purposes of this course they're pretty much interchangeable okay so when we're talking about analysis analyzing an argument same thing as taking apart a machine to see how the parts fit together okay we have the parts so to do that for an argument for this analogy to keep working arguments have to have parts just like machines have parts so that you can take them apart and they need to have characteristic ways that they fit together or relate to one another for just like in machines certain parts fit together a hole fits a screw gears mesh those kinds of things we need to f if if this value if this uh, analogy works arguments are going to have some of those same kinds of features and it turns out they do otherwise i wouldn't be using that analogy the good thing about logic and mapping arguments is that the number of parts that you have to keep track of is actually a really short list if you have ever seriously been interested in re car repair or any other kinds of machine repair or engine repair uh, you know that there are just like hundreds if not thousands of different parts differently shaped things made of different materials that all fit together it's super complicated and you can't just swap parts from one engine to another one because engines come in all sorts of different sizes and shapes and powers and, and, and all that kind of thing in contrast when you're talking about arguments arguments only have two different kinds of parts that's it just two the complexity in arguments is the variety in which those parts can be stuck together so perhaps a better analogy for this would be Legos Legos only come in a finite amount of blocks and especially if we take not you know we don't talk about space Lego or any of the branded Legos we just talk about the regular core Lego set you're talking about basically bricks of different sizes and maybe some flat pieces and that's about it but from those you know couple dozen different shapes of bricks you can make literally infinite things by combining them in different ways even though they have pretty strict and straightforward rules about how they fit together arguments are more like that very small number of unique pieces but infinite possibilities in how they fit together so for arguments we have only two pieces and the first kind of piece is arguably the most important kind of piece there's only one in every argument only one piece like this so it's like the, the queen of a beehive for me to throw in a third analogy for you um, and that is the point of the argument the thing that you're trying to convince somebody else of now that's just one part and it's simple and that's fine the second part is also kind of simple and that is there's the other type of part is reasons that's it those are the two parts the point of an argument the unique thing that you're trying to convince people of and then the reasons that support it or that are at least intended to back it up and make it sound less controversial and more plausible that's it those are the only two types of reasons the complexity comes in in two places one is kind of the Lego place which is even though there are just reasons well there's a wide variety of reasons out there right so think of like different colors of Lego blocks right um, they all fit together the exact same way but they have different contents um, and usually for real life arguments that are actually kind of matter and address topics of consequence and complexity uh, you don't just have reasons to convince somebody of something often they won't be convinced by those reasons to believe the thing you're trying to make them believe because they find the reasons that you use to, to support it almost as controversial as the thing as the controversial thing you're trying to get them to believe so then you have to find you have to reassure them and you have to find reasons to accept those reasons which in turn are there to help them accept the point of the argument and that can keep happening if you have ever been around a five-year-old you will know that they kind of do this regression and they keep asking why right so you explain why the sky is blue and they ask and 
so they ask, well, why is the sky blue? You explain that. I can tell you that, but I would make this video really long. Um, and then they ask, well, why, why are those things that were that you cited in that explanation? Why were those? Why are those true? And then you have to explain those, and then it's why. And then you say more things, and then they say why. And uh, eventually, right? You just want them to shut up and go away, so you stop, right? So that's one reason why you might stop is just because you're exhausted or frustrated, or you just run out of information. You, I don't know, right? Um, most people aren't five-year-olds. That might be a controversial claim. Um, and so the, another way that an argument can stop that regression of reasons is that the person you're arguing to, that the recipient, the audience uh, of the argument, um, eventually gets satisfied. And at a particular layer of reasons, um, they will stop questioning the truth of those reasons because you'll have reached a level where the reason that you cite isn't controversial to that person at all. They already accept it before they started talking to you. So that's a good that's a good ending place for the argument. It's a good starting place for them to get convinced of the point. So, but the way that these reasons stack up on top of each other and branch out, that's the Lego-like complexity that you can get even though all the pieces are of the same type. The other complication when it comes to arguments and talking about argument parts is a purely self-inflicted wound. And that is, we have a ton of vocabulary that people use to talk about argument parts. So it might seem like there's dozens of things happening in an argument when really there's only those two things happening. So the in this course, we're gonna have to deal with four different names, four different labels for the exact same thing. So the one that you're maybe, well, I talked, I used the word the point of the argument, that's one way to, to refer to the ultimate goal of an argument, the thing that you're trying to convince people of, but you're also probably familiar in the context of essay writing with the word thesis. The thesis just is the point of the argument that you're trying to talk about. In philosophy, the word we most commonly use, even though sometimes we'll use the word thesis or point, is conclusion. And so you're probably also familiar with that because that sometimes get used, gets used in plain English when we're talking about arguments too. Unfortunately, the Rationale Online website, that's the one that we're going to use to physically, visually map arguments, uses a fourth and completely different term to talk about the same thing, and that is a contention, which seems super formal. You might have heard it if you've done debate. They also use that term to talk about the uh, the point that's at issue that the two sides are arguing over. But the point I'm trying to make here is that there are various names. They are all synonymous. They all mean the same thing. I will try, I will probably through habit, talk about conclusions. But when I'm talking about rationale, I will probably also slip in the word contention. When I'm talking about essay writing and arguments in writing, I will also use the word thesis. So I'm going to switch back and forth between these terms. You're just going to have to do your best to realize, oh, wait, 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 he's just talking, he's talking about the same thing, the end point, the goal of an argument. Similarly, I used the word reasons when I was talking about the structure of arguments. That's not the only word we have for that either, right? Uh, in English, talk about support. In science, you might talk about evidence. Um, in philosophy, we have a fancy word that goes with conclusion, and that's a premise or premises, right? At root though, they're all supporting claims or reasons. I can usually get away with talking about them as reasons pretty consistently because in almost every context that we use it, the word reasons still makes sense. So I'll probably pre be pretty consistent with that term, but you have to realize that these other things, especially English profs when they're talking about support and things like that, they're talking about reasons. They're talking about the backup for the conclusion. All right, so that's the parts of arguments. Now, half of figuring out how an engine work is taking it apart. The other half, and, and, and not forgetting how to put it back together. The other half is taking a look at the parts and seeing if each part individually is how it's supposed to be and seeing if the parts as they look like they're intended to fit together if they actually fit together in the way that they're intended 
or if a part is too small or too skinny or too fat or, or something like that. It's misshapen, broken, those kinds of things. Argument evaluation is what we call that same sort of process when we're talking about an argument. And simply boils down to evaluation expressing a judgment that we make about whether an argument is good. And what good means for arguments is a little bit complicated, right? But it doesn't seem complicated because you're actually an expert at it already, pretty much. You have a certain level of expertise and competence at evaluating arguments. You know this stuff. You spend a lot of time around arguments. You've been teenagers. Some of you may be parents and welcome to the other side of the whole you know, dynamic there. But people are good at judging the goodness of arguments because we've had a lot of practice and teaching informal, not a lot of formal practice at it, but a ton of informal practice with it, right? Even so, there's lots of times when you are not good at evaluating the goodness of an argument. And there are a couple really kind of specific circumstances that we know through research are ones where people are particularly bad at being unbiased and thorough at evaluating the persuasiveness of an argument. When the topic is close to you, right, when it really matters, your emotions get involved and they tend to distract you. That's a time when, and, and that's a time when you would like for your argumentation abilities, your critical thinking, to be at the top of their game. But frequently, that's exactly those circumstances when it's important to you, is when you are afflicted by other things which interfere with your ability to properly and impartially and thoroughly and skillfully interrogate an argument and figure out if it really works or not. Also, when it's adversarial, when you have somebody kind of on the other side, when there are teams of some sort, uh, some of us aren't very competitive, but lots of us are. And one of the easiest things to get that competition going, as you'll see in some of the readings where we talk about tribalism and implicit bias, um, even that humans are very social creatures, and so even the hint that there are groups and that groups can be identified by differing beliefs really tends to make you irrationally committed to your side. And if that happens, you really become very defensive about the quality of the arguments that your side presents, and you become overly skeptical and critical about arguments that the other side presents, such that you aren't a biased judge, and that's not cool. The other time when we're not really good at it is when the argument is complicated, when there's multiple pieces to keep track of and the argument takes a long time to explain because there's nuance in it or because there's multiple stages. You first have to get convinced of this, then of that, and your working memory isn't built for that exactly, and it, there's other complexities, and so it's hard to be confident once you've, that, that you can see the whole argument at once and know that each part works as intended. And the last thing that we really need to improve is that even if you're pretty good, and all of you are pretty good at evaluating arguments, and even if you're pretty good at evaluating arguments in these adverse circumstances right here, for the vast majority of the time, you are not good at sharing, at articulating your judgments of an argument's goodness or badness to other people. It's a kind of an internal thing. It's an immediate intuitive sense that this is a persuasive argument or not. And that's usually more hit than miss, but it's almost always something that you cannot um, clearly share with somebody else and explain why you find a particular argument persuasive. If they don't, they usually are really poor at telling you why they why it fails to feel good to them and so we're going to work on both on all of this stuff we're going to work on identifying those times when you're not good at evaluating arguments we're going to work on techniques like argument mapping 
that help boost your chances of being a competent evaluator, even in adverse circumstances like that. And we're going to vastly improve your ability to explain why you think the way you do about a particular argument, which plays a big role in getting people on your side and persuading them, right? It doesn't do very uh, much to say, trust me, especially if you're a student, you're young, you're the low man on the totem pole at a business, you're not the expert yet, you're struggling to establish your authority, your expertise, you can't say, trust me, I've been around here a long time, this is the way it goes. You have to be able to articulate your reasoning so that other people can follow it, appreciate it, respect it, and adopt it. So, before we start exploring what a good conclusion looks like, we got to get this out of the way and that is what a good what good doesn't mean and I pick this out because often this is what biases our evaluation the most and that is we tend to evaluate arguments based on whether they agree with our point of view it's a natural human tendency similarly we tend to evaluate arguments poorly when they're from the other side, when they argue in favor of the other side, against our point of view. And this is just, we can't do this. This is just uh, impermissible, unwise, not a good thing to do. So it's going to be hard to resist, and in certain circumstances might be impossible to, to resist. So we have to find ways to not get ourselves in those kinds of circumstances, and instead put ourselves in circumstances that lend us to a different way to evaluate an argument that doesn't reduce to just does it agree with what I already believe therefore it's a good argument or does it disagree with what I already believe therefore th there must be some problem in it and then you dismiss it without actually identifying if there is a problem right so the general lesson here is we are not in the business of criticizing any argument by looking at the conclusion we have to look at the other parts the reasons and how they're arranged. So here's, here's the spoiler, here's the answer to that. Good arguments have three features, and a good argument has to have all three. If it lacks any one of the three, it's not a good argument. It's got a flaw, often a fatal flaw, that needs to be repaired for that argument to become convincing. We have another technical term, in philosophy for convincing and that is cogent a good argument is a cogent argument uh, I'm not going to test you on that you're not really going to have to remember that word you're not going to have to remember the property of cogency to succeed in this course I'm sharing it with you just because I want you to occasionally nerd out or to recognize when somebody else is nerding out about arguments cogency is what philosophers is the term philosophers use to describe the particular goodness of an argument. And the three parts are that we need to have a good argument has acceptable foundational claims. That is, it starts from, sol from a solid base. All of its support, all of its evidence is relevant. And you need to have sufficient evidence to carry the day, to outweigh the other opposing points, the rival views, the counter examples, the, the cons, all that kind of stuff. So you need to have ARG and it's like a dad joke. Somebody, I'm, I, I like it. That's part of the reason why I kind of adopted this system is that it makes it easy to remember that there are three components and they are the three letters of argument here. And we had to kind of stretch it because really this should be an S because we're talking about sufficiency or enoughness and not really not really grounds, so it's kind of awkward, but we're shoving it in there anyways and making it work. ARG, those are the three things that we need. And we're definitely going to talk way more about those three things and how to evaluate each one individually to make sure that the argument you're looking at has all three in the proper amount and counts as a cogent argument. But to give you a kind of a visual analogy of how those three things work, I've got a little, got a little picture to share to kind of re-describe it hopefully in a way that kind of makes sense until we actually start doing it ourselves and that is if you're trying to support a conclusion you have to start 
with acceptable facts and claims. Things that are, to everybody involved in the argument, not controversial. You need to have some common ground upon which everybody is willing to stand. That's what acceptability is all about. You have to start at an uncontroversial, acceptable place where there's a collection of claims that everybody involved in the discussion can agree, yep, all of these things are good. I don't need anybody to convince me of any of this stuff. I come into this discussion already convinced of these things. To support the conclusion, though, we need to build up from that common foundation that everybody has, that even our opponents share, with lines of relevant support that can reach the conclusion. And the key thing here is that the support that we build up from the non-controversial base has to be relevant. And relevant just means like pointed in the right direction towards the conclusion. We can build up lines of support and evidence that kind of go off in a direction and are themselves, you know, a, a solid building beam, right? But if they don't get built under the floor such that they kind of help support it, then they're not helpful, right? So this is where the R part of ARG comes in. We want to make sure that the lines of support, the evidence that we build off of that solid base is building in the right direction towards the conclusion. And then lastly, sorry about that, lastly what we need to look at is do we have enough of these supports to hold up the conclusion, especially considering there might be other reasons out there weighing it down, that is objections. So we have, this is the G part, the, the last third is taking a look at all of the reasons for and against a particular conclusion and trying to estimate, trying to judge whether or not the support we have can hold up the conclusion even in the face of objections weighing it down. And so those are the three things that we are going to do, and then I'm going to show you kind of recipes, techniques, skills, to do each one of those things nicely, thoroughly, accurately on any argument such that at the end of that process, and yeah, it's going to be a kind of a long and nitpicky and drawn out process, but at the end of that process, you can be really confident that you have judged it fairly and accurately, and that in doing so, you're able to articulate your judgment clearly to somebody else so that they can share it. And then that's all, lots of times the best way to convince them, hey, here's how I see that argument. It works because it meets this and this and this and this, and it has this slight problem over here, but we can deal with that by this. Now, in this particular course, we're going to be talking about three different kinds of arguments, and we're going to analyze and evaluate all of them. If you choose to do those things, remember the flowchart has some kind of decision parts where you can choose not to do one or two or all three of these things. That would be kind of unwise, but you know, it's your choice, right? Um, but if you choose to do these things, each one of the kinds of arguments that I have in those three argument analysis and evaluation modules are importantly different in certain key respects. So in the kind of the, in the first module, we're going to be working on listicles. And a listicle is a portmanteau that is a cramming together of two different words. It's made of the words list and article because a listicle refers to a list-based article. And you are definitely familiar with those on the internet because the internet is filled with clickbaity list-based articles, right? They're easy to read. They can cram a lot of ads in, in between each element of the list. Th they're perfect, right? We're going to be using listicles that it not just lists, but list-based articles that themselves are arguments. They have to be an argumentative listicle. We're going to be using those as our practice, as our tutorial, because it turns out, you won't be surprised, that listicles are pretty terrible and pretty simplistic. In fact, they're over simple, right? And so that makes them really good as initial subjects for you to practice both the analysis, because the analysis is going to be pretty simple and straightforward, and to practice the ARG evaluation, because it's going to have, because they're clearly bad arguments, you're going to get some practice on seeing where the badness is, and you might be surprised that some listicles, even though they're bad and they're not 
cogent overall because they fail at least one of A, R, or G, that they can be good in other respects. That is, uh, a, a listicle could pass the acceptability criterion with, with flying colors, but, but have utterly irrelevant or insufficient grounds for its conclusion. So it can be a really bad argument, yet still pass one of the criteria really well. And so that's good to learn firsthand. So we're gonna learn, and they're simple, so that we can focus on the techniques of ARG evaluation and argument analysis, and learn the nuts and bolts of the software rationale online, and just how to submit things to Canvas and things like that. That's why everybody's gonna begin with these. But then after you've kind of gone, learned the ropes with listicles, you're gonna maybe analyze an S, analyze and evaluate an essay, or an editorial. And we're doing essays because um, you made them. And it turns out that you probably didn't make a good one. That is, the emphasis wasn't on the quality of the argumentation in them. And in college, especially when you start specializing in your major in your later years, the need to have insightful and expert uh, arguments in the papers that you write, in the work that you do more generally, gets more and more important. And the quality of your writing in terms of style and grammar and stuff, that, that is still expected, but it's reduced in importance compared to actual content, which is argument. So those are gonna tend to be more complex than listicles. And one of the focuses of taking an already written essay and reworking it is to improve the argument that's in it because usually those arguments are not very well developed. And it's also this, the intent of this is to show you that the proper focus of writing an argumentative essay shouldn't be all the stuff you learned in 105 and 106, that it, the style of writing and things like that. It's the actual quality of the argument. So in working over that essay, you're not gonna redraft it five times. In fact, you're hardly gonna look at your original essay. We're gonna work on a map instead, develop that, and then we're gonna write the new final draft of the essay based purely on the map, not looking at the old copy at all. And, big promise here, that's gonna be easy and way less stressful than the usual way that you have learned to draft your writings, okay? If you choose to do editorials, I've picked those because they're real world arguments. They're they're, they're out there on the internet, yes, but when I talk about editorials, we're talking about opinion pages in major newspapers, we're talking about um, blogs where people kind of seriously talk about their viewpoint on an issue, movie reviews to a certain extent, those kinds of, those are arguments, they're real life, they concern real things out there in the world, right? And that means that they're both probably more sophisticated than listicles, but also have a little bit of trickiness in them and that they can be sloppy and confusing, you gotta figure them out, and they can be complex. So this, if you're, you're gonna do this, if you really want to understand how to do, how to really understand somebody else's argument in more detail and be confident not only that you understand how they think it works, but that you can pass a judgment for yourself on how convincing that argument actually is for you or somebody else. So those, those three kinds of arguments have some important differences and I'll remind you of them as you, we start working on this. That's the end of this video. I'm always surprised by the last slide. <laughs> the next video up from me is talking about the course and talking about my best advice gathered from students who've taken this course before on what the kind of best strategies for success are. And that's even more important for this three-week madness to get off on the right foot and to stay moving forward and on track. So we're going to talk about that in the next video. So when you're ready, click that link and, uh, and get on that video.